Hi, I'm Edward Samuelson, and this is The Cinephiles. Uh, today I'm joined by my co-host, Eric Cohen, Jeff Galishaw, and Mike Foltz. Today we're going to be continuing a discussion. That's not Mike Foltz. Well, he's over there. Hey, that's Mike Foltz. All right. All right, today we're going to I'm not black, and I'm not proud. <laughs> well, neither am I. Anyway, let's get to let's get the discussion today. Today we're going to be continuing off from a conversation we had a while ago uh, about the Masters of Horror film series. And today we're going to be discussing the remaining films that we didn't get to discuss earlier around. Um, we're going to start it off with Chocolate, which was directed by the series creator and written by him as well. Uh, and it's entitled Chocolate, and it was directed by Mick Garris and stars Henry Thomas as a person who has an extra sense that allows him to connect with a person, uh, I guess you could say, who kind of, who's kind of psychotic, would you say? Well, the, it's, the whole premise is he can see through the eyes of someone else, and, and you're not quite sure. He's falling in love with this person. She's obviously a female. Um, he can see who she is, because whenever she looks in the mirror, he can see who that person is. And then later on in the story, you find she, you, she kills somebody. So he, so he goes out of his way to try to find her now. She lives in Canada. Of course. Um, Which I love because the series is shot in Canada, so of course, why not make it Canada? Um, That's Henry Thomas from E.T. Who I always, I usually always like as an actor, but in this one I feel the entire show was you like very... like him as an actor? I think he's been good in a few things that I've seen him in. I mean, he's great in E.T., of course, but he's also very good in Gangs of New York, even though the movie is not that great. And uh, he was good in a movie called Fever, which was directed by Alex Winter. Um, unfortunately, this one is is a really poorly directed film and as well as written, and it's very surprising mm. too. Yes. Um, the one of the problems I had too was the tone of the film. Uh, you have uh, Henry Thomas, who's a kind of like I guess you say kind of like a genetic type engineer or for a food company, and uh, he has like a sidekick or a person like Matt Fewer, who better known as Max Headroom. Mm. Um, and there's scenes with him that he's a like a kind of like a punk rocker in his 40s or early mm. 50s, and it's it's very very goofy and it's, it's distracting from the. Yeah, it's just it's like it's this random stuff that's supposed to be like character development. It's also important to know that Henry Thomas's character is kind of in a vulnerable state in his life because he just had this terrible breakup with, mm -hmm. with his his wife, and he has a kid through her, and it's just it's a terribly written, terribly directed. It's one of these things, these pieces that you think is building up to a twist ending that never happens. Oh, I agree with you. And it just, it just yeah. doesn't happen. Well, and you're just like, what the fuck? Well, that was my problem with the film. I felt the whole film was just random mm -hmm. because it's never explained why this happens, you know. And then he go, and then he falls in love with this girl, and then, you know, he's sort of going through a divorce and child custody at the same time. And I guess that was supposed to be character, but again, it adds nothing really to the story except to make him seem even more unhinged, or maybe to give a reason why he might be unhinged. But I mean. I really just didn't enjoy this episode at all. I thought it was a big waste of time. And to put a pun in there, um, chocolate was not very tasteful. Oh, very good. That's a very well said, my friend. Yeah, it's really. Simple. Thank you. It's, re it's really, it's, it's really bad. Um, my biggest. I decided that instead of watching. Uh, Chocolate. I decided to eat some chocolate, so I, I don't. I didn't see this. It's a terrible episode, and one of the biggest problems. I'll right. close up on this: is that is the oh. lack of explanation. I don't need them to actually come out it's and say why. It's a very half-assed episode. Yeah, it's like they even go, well, well I don't know why we're, we're having these connections with each other. Uh, maybe it was this and that, but they don't even give you a hint. It's just it's too exactly. It's just too out there in the open, and, and they're trying to give you an answer, but not really. It's a terrible episode, one of the weakest episodes in the series. You're lucky you missed it. It's a good thing Mike missed this one. So that's why you didn't have the to The chocolate was good. Uh, you probably, like uh, the nudity, though. All right, well, let's go on to... Um, well, how would you rate uh, the nudity? Uh, Excellent. Guys, excellent. Excellent. Nudity. Excellent, nudity, excellent nudity, Mike. That's the only reason to actually sit there and watch. Wait, is that sarcasm? Or no, is it's that excellent nudity. She's it, really uh, hot. I'll give her that. It's Canadian nudity. Uh, Bush? In fact, I noticed that the uh, I've watched I some of the second so. season episodes, and the Masters of Horror tend to get ha uh, increased the nudity quotient with each episode. Well, that's thankfully Trying because to get of the HBO. ratings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not HBO, I mean, but cable television. From Showtime. Yeah, well, cable TV, man. Gotta love God it. God bless cable. Um, all right, well, let's go on to a different uh, type of film here, and this will be a uh, return to horror by a director who's dabbled in horror and comedy, and he's basically known as a comedy director, but he's actually, I guess you say, uh, is also dabbles in horror, and the horror is always has comic undertones, and that yes. film is Dear Woman, and uh, the director, again, is John Landis, yes. who, of course, is uh, well-known for, Amer what is it, uh, National Lampoon's Animal House, and American Ford, Werewolf in American London. American Werewolf in London. London, and this one actually... Blues uh, Brothers. And the Blues Brothers, and Innocent Blood, which was another return to the horror genre. Um, this one actually has a lot of John Lance's trademarks, including horror and humor, and, of course, there's a great reference, which I will give credit to, uh, American Werewolf in London. 
I love this episode. This was my favorite Take episode away, of the series. I mean, uh, I think it started off correctly because really Brian Ben Ben stars in it. And <laughs> unless you've really watched uh, his HBO series, Dream On, Dream On, which John Landis produced and wrote for. That's right. I forgot about that. Uh, you, you probably never really heard of him except for maybe a bit rolling clean and sober. But I like this episode just for the fact that it mixed horror and ridiculous comedy and I mean it was very entertaining throughout the whole thing because even the whole premise a deer woman uh, you know going out trampling people is just so ridiculous in of itself it couldn't it's help really but be goofy. it's really goofy especially I remember this one scene and I was like are you kidding me they go to an Indian casino and there's a talking deer head that tells jokes I'm sorry. That's what uh, helps add to the ridiculousness of it. It's something you can't really take. It's an actually episode, the, the ending is fairly suspenseful, though, where his friend gets trapped mm -hmm. and realizes that, uh oh, I'm fucked. I uh, like he said. I I'd actually, for once, I actually like something. Is like when a character does something stupid, he goes, "I'm a fucking idiot." I actually like that the character admitted that for once yeah. in a movie. You never see that. Well, it was a choice between watching this episode or actually eating a dear woman. And I decided Wait, to... Wait, eating a deer woman or eating out a deer woman? Spit take! Yeah, yeah! I did not see this episode, folks. I'm sorry. I, I actually... But I did eat chocolate. I enjoyed it. Well, I, I did. I like some of the humor. It's very goofy and fun, but uh, if you're looking for a real... If you're looking for... And that's one thing. The tone is shifts from t place to place occasionally, but it's a better overall mix of humor and horror than I'm chocolates. glad to hear it because John exactly. Landis has not made a decent film since Trading Places. And even Trading yeah. Places is very that. dated when you watch it, but mm -hmm. it's still got some good yucks in it. Coming uh, to America was good. It was all right. Coming to America was all right. I'll give you that. Hey, I what about, about Beverly Hills Cop 3? Oh, wait, that sucks. <laughs> okay. Of course. <laughs> well, let's move on to the, to the next one here. And but he's going to make, uh, John Landis is going to make uh, a movie about William Gaines. Did you hear about that? <coughs> oh, yes, and I heard the rumor it's going to be Seth Rogen is playing uh, William Gaines. That's what I was hearing as a rumor. Now, that's a spit take worthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I did see a picture of Bill Gaines years ago, and I hate to say it, he really does look like Seth Rogen years ago. I mean, huh, go figure. All right, well, let's go on to the next one, and this is one that... Uh, well, by the way, did you guys see the Oscars? What's wrong with Seth Rogen? He looked terrible. He looked like an, a Hasidic terrorist. Oh, uh, well, I can't <laughs> comment on that. <laughs> there was just a random... All that's right. random. That's <laughs> only... <laughs> I, okay, that to was... To go with that episode. That was derailed that, that topic. <laughs> I wish he would have made a man. All right, let me go on to the next one here, guys. I'm trying to do this here. <laughs> All right, the next one uh, I will consider uh, one of the worst episodes in the series, and I know a few of the pe people here will agree with me. Um, the director in question actually directed one of the greatest horror films of all time. Never really lived up to his potential. Uh, then fl floundered in mediocrity for many years, and is still living off this one film. And that film is *The Texas Chainsaw Massacre*, and the director is Toby Hooper. And what's the? Um, and the film yeah, is the *Dance of the Dead*, Thank which you. takes uh. a Richard Matheson <laughs> story, and, uh. and basically <laughs> bores the shit out of you for an hour. And uh, let's get into this one. It basically takes a supernatural approach slash uh, with a Mad Max type uh, world. Yeah, it's like it's weird. With goth. It's a weird, I mean, there's one kind of compelling idea, the fact that they reanimate the dead for people's entertainment. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, what, what <laughs> happened to Toby Hooper, man? I saw Eaten the Eatin Alive the other night. Um, what a shitty film. That was this film after hey, Texas I Chainsaw don't Massacre. Mind it. It's a remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but from but the... Neville Brand has just like got this like ridiculous performance going on. I know we're supposed to be talking about Dance of so the Dead. So you're getting like my Dance, Dance of the Dead is just, it sucks. Eating Alive is a more interesting subject than in the actual episode. I never Dance saw of Dance of the Dead, but... It's bad, dude. But even the the premise just wasn't interesting. Well, Robert England was in it. So it had that an interesting presence. It had a sort of a compelling idea for a sort of post-apocalyptic future kind of thing, where, where, where you know people are just giving in to like just drugs and disorder and stuff like that. But nothing. It was all. Aesthetics. No. There was no. Real you never structure. feel like you're in the future. You it's feel like you're in diarrhea. present day golf clubs. That's how I felt. Right. Um, and one problem too is the acting is some of the worst I've seen in the series. It's totally uneven. These people are like in different films. There's only one effective scene, perhaps the flashbacks to this uh, nuclear type apocalypse thing happening. That was actually kind of effective. However, the editing is very MTV style, mm -hmm. and it rips off 
uh, a lot from Natural Born Killers. All the scenes in the car where they're, you know, driving. Yeah, there's there's a lot of like like it's just a lot of scenes that rip off other movies, and there's no like original compelling no. vision it could call its own. Very very poor uh, direction from Toby Hooper too. The acting, as I said, is just god awful. I mean, oh god, especially the two. You know, there's the two leads who are okay, and then you have the other two that are with them. <laughs> yeah. Totally coat hangers, and they're completely just must have been picked up off the street. Yeah. Um, definitely one of the worst. How would you guys rate it? Is it definitely in your bottom? It was my it was worst. worst. It's your worst? Yeah, it's it my worst, 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 personally. Well, what do you think? Just Toby Hooper has just got He's lucky on one, one, one movie? One movie he got lucky on. And <laughs> Actually, he did another film that I do like, which is called uh, entitled The Fun House. Um, Fun House is all right. It's not a bad film, but he never made anything half as good as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Well, maybe he's just a one-hit wonder, that's all. You know, mm. there, there are those people in film that... Uh, it's more to it than that, but I can't discuss it on the air. Uh, oh. Uh, yes, uh, let, let's not discuss Toby Hooper on a Masters of Horror film. <laughs> I will say this, though. He did not... He, I will say this. TV he, show? He did, not, he did not direct Poltergeist... He did not. He was just a director's name that was put on a project. The real yeah, but everybody was. knows that. That yeah, is that's slanderous, that sir. Yeah, Spielberg's <laughs> always credited for directing. Yeah, that film. that's that's always. Well, was that was that the uh, the career-ending <laughs> news that you couldn't tell us? No, that's not it. But anyway, that actually <laughs> did damage his career quite a bit. Did he like suck bit. your dick or something? <laughs> hey, dude, I'm, that's no. You're not denying it. Not <laughs> too much. Come on, Mr. Austin. All right, let's get in the <laughs> next on. one. Let's get in the next one. Okay. Well, uh, are you a fan of Spring Awakening? Well, let's Spring Awakening. I I'm never <laughs> okay. denial, denial. bad inside joke. Okay, I'm I'm There's in nothing deep wrong shit here. Spring Awakening. Thank God for Final Cut Pro. Well. Okay. <laughs> next uh, next film on the on the list here is um, actually I will consider the absolute worst film in the series. Um, the director actually made a film that I liked earlier and he showed a lot of promise and actually it starred the same person who starred in this episode, which is Angel Bettis, and the film before was May. This one is entitled Sick Girl and it's directed by uh, Lucky McKee. And it's a, I guess you could say it's, it takes a lot of elements that were in uh, May mm. and kind of changes them around a little bit and really destroys Angela Bettis. I mean, I, I loved her in May. I thought it was one of the best performances I've seen that year. And she completely did a 180. And I mean, this is one of the worst performances I've seen a good actress give. Um, she really ups the, the lesbian content and becomes very butch and Betty Davis-like. And it's very distracting and ridiculous. I didn't even think it was Betty Davis. I just thought she was just a very awkward, nerdy girl. And she was just failing miserably at this portrayal of this person. And to have Misty Monday involved, she was just she's just a terrible actress. She's not even a good softcore actress. I mean, this felt to me not as a masters of horror interpretation, but it felt like this guy was doing something for seduction cinema. You know, those idiots with, uh, you know, that employ Misty Monday for every other film. Well, as you know, they own her name, so that's why she's billed in this I one. I thought it was incredibly Brown. annoying. I just found myself incredibly annoyed. Yeah. Bad special episode. effects. Man. Terrible. Yes. Bad. Bad. It was very sly. It felt like somebody's, like, with the exception, it was like somebody's uh, school film project where they went crazy in the, on the sex quotient. You know what saddens me yeah. too is that um, there's there's a scene in the end of the movie where they're trying to you know make a statement against you know discrimination against gays and there's you know because they live mm -hmm. in the apartment building and the landlord comes up to him and says I want you out of here because you guys are such you know perverts mm -hmm. and whatever and I, I was actually for the landlord because these people are so depraved and, and awful. I mean, I wouldn't want these people in my building either because they had all these bugs right. and they were just, you know, flaunting themselves and, and leaving the door open in front of this girl. You're supposed to feel for these people because, you know, their their gender, you know, and they're just being discriminated against. But you don't get that at all, and that's a really big failure on the part of the. Director I think they actors. should have been discriminated against for horrible acting. That's what's ruined it. That's the, it's awful, and as you said, the special effects are terrible, and all it is is just a, a, a lazy rewrite of May. That's all it is. Well, when you introduced. Uh, uh, Toby Hooper's episode Dance of the Dead with like talking about the one hit wonder I thought you were actually talking about this episode because it seems like this is really the only May was really the only good thing he's done because I saw The Woods I didn't like it I saw this episode I didn't like it and then I saw the script that he wrote for a film called Roman where they switch places and Wait, Angela Woods Batiste directed it's, it's on a DVD for over a year Campbell? two years really? yeah it was supposed to come to theaters, but it got delayed. The oh, theater, wow. They didn't, I didn't have, think it ever got released. They just basically said it's not good enough, and they released it to uh, yeah, video. It's, and it's, I can see why, because that didn't even have any promise either. It's a lazy ripoff of Suspiria. Exactly. So that's why I'm like, and to that me, And Suspiria doesn't even make any sense, so I can imagine a lazy version <laughs> of Suspiria. Oh, Suspiria is an art film. It's not really supposed to make sense. It's a living, it's a living canvas, but that's off the subject. But the thing is, is that Lucky McKee, He's taking a lot of the ideas from other films Sorry. and just recycling them. And then, unfortunately, this one, he recycled his other film. 
He recycled May. He's a one-hit wonder. He's not he's, coming up with any more original ideas. He's like ideas. Toby Hooper Jr. Yeah, mm -hmm. Angela mm -hmm. Betta should divorce him. <laughs> I don't disagree with anything that was just discussed here. Actually, I don't think they're married, but hey. Let's move on. Let's no, I think they are married, aren't they? No. no, no, they just work. They together. work together very well. Um, uh, very well. well. No, once, no. They once, did. very well. <laughs> it's Christ. a great, it's a good, very good film. Well, she wasn't. Um, all right. Well, the next she film we're going to be discussing is actually probably perhaps one of my favorites of the series, and actually the person who's actually who directed this is I wouldn't really consider him a master of horror. And what's surprising, he actually really made it, I think, like I said, one of the best episodes of the series, and the director is uh, Bill Malone, or William Malone, who directed uh, their House on Haunted Hill remake and the horrible Fear.com. Um, the <laughs> film here is entitled uh, Fair Hair Child, which stars Lori Petty, and um, it concerns a girl who is kidnapped and used in a demon ritual, or I guess you could say a, super, an, a ritual to revive a, a dead child. Well, they keep a dead child alive. Yeah, to keep this dead child they've alive. Been, they've been kidnapping uh, kids. Mm -hmm. For, to, so this guy can feed on them in order to keep him alive. After and after, like so many kids, he will permanently be alive. Is the whole idea. And she's like the last person. And uh, yeah, you know what's so interesting about this? And one? She's like the first girl. Too, yeah, she was it? the like, first girl, which I thought was interesting because they were actually discussing. And he falls in love. He with falls her. in love with her. And uh, actually, I like the ending too in this. Well, I, I I'm going to say just so we can move on, you know, move this quickly. But I I like this episode. I thought it had some moments that were really well directed. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought the handling of when this kid, the dead kid, turns into the demon character. I thought that was really authentically creepy. Yeah, it's a very. I thought it was film. very effective. I didn't like the. I thought the ending got into like you know, it just. He. I would have liked it to have been more subtle. I would like to be a little bit more. Open. All stuff when he transformed into a living boy again was just—it was like straight out of Pinocchio or something. You know, uh, just like that I thought was a little silly. I, I still like the ending. I mean, I like the way it was wrapped up, but I wish they would have left it a little bit more open and not didn't answer everything. You know what I'm saying? Because they give like a definitive answer what happened. And I, I wish. Like and I don't know why. This is the big problem I have with like Masters of Horror and stuff like that. Is that it would have been far more interesting to me if the parents, aka Lori Petty, whoever the other actor were, came across as more normal. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be more interesting if these are just normal parents trying desperately to keep their son yeah, alive. Yeah, because they come off. They a made them psychotic. too much like freaks. They come know? off a little psychotic because if you really, you can love your child and be like do crazy shit. Right. And that, and I'd actually like to see a normal portrayal where like these people are just normal people and they decide to do this and they don't want to do it. You know, they're right. really hesitant, but they want their their child to you know come back. But what I liked, like I said, the, is very well directed. Especially the flashbacks. There's a scene where the guy is actually mm -hmm. like imagining he's wearing like he has the dunce cap and he's in the water. It's really very eerie. Well, very some well of directed. Stuff had, it had great visuals in it. I don't know if it was exceptionally direct because there's parts of it which I thought were poorly directed. But I thought like anything dealing with that demon thing, I thought was yeah, really was well done. I was impressive. like surprised actually how impressive that was. And then it's so funny is it takes kind of like an idea that's been used before. What'd you think? I thought it was entertaining, and it, it also had one of the most ridiculously funny scenes I've ever seen in a movie that wasn't intentional. Um, <laughs> when the girl gets hit, her, she's on her bike and she just gets hit by a car, and it's supposed to be something that's supposed to make you jump, but it looks so messed up, it ended up making me laugh. And But other than that, it's generally a creepy episode from a guy I really didn't think had it in him, but it seemed like with this, he brought his A game with uh, this episode, so I actually liked it more than I expected to. And I want to say too, one last thing, final thing on this, the girl Tara, whoever played, I forgot her name, is a phenomenal, very good, uh, very good performance by the Girl. Oh, it was it was much better performed. It could have come across as cloying and, and silly. She came off the as little very relationship warm. between her and and you knew. I mean, you know, they try to build up build up this twist that you find out that this kid is actually dead. But you I, kind of I knew it. it out. I knew you it already because you don't see his face exactly. in the flashbacks, but, so obviously. Yeah. But I definitely will say, uh, definitely an excellent performance by the lead actress, and it's definitely one of the best episodes in the series. I think you guys can agree. Were you on eating that. chocolate during that one too? I don't know what the fuck I was. Or doing. Were you <laughs> eating out a deer woman? <laughs> All right, well, let's go. we only got a few minutes left here, so let's go on to the uh, last two here. Um, this film is entitled uh, uh, Imprint, and it was uh, director Takashi Miike's, uh, I guess you could say, first American production. Um, he's a respected Japanese director, very famous for the film Audition. Um, this one stars Billy Drago in a tale of, I guess you could say, it's kind of very much like Kaidan. Uh, Billy Drago, for those who don't know, was Paul was uh, Frank Nitti in yep. uh, the, the Untouchables. Untouchables. The one that gets pushed off the building. Very, uh, very creepy man. Very weird film. And by the way, we want to mention too. This this episode was actually banned from broadcast for being too controversial or too violent. And uh, it's easy to see why it was banned. It's a pretty violent little tale. Um, now, Probably one of the most horrific torture scenes I have ever seen, ever. Mm -hmm. 
Very reminiscent of the scene, that famous scene in Audition. Yeah. Worse. Worse. Almost worse. Worse. worse, yeah. To make. worse. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely no way they could cut that down to make it arable for television, I don't think, without making the film incoherent. Um, what I had a problem with his film is that there's a lot, I'm not a big Takashi Miki fan. I will be honest, he's not one of my favorite directors. However, I will give him credit on this one. The film is very beautiful. It does not feel like a television production. It actually feels like a film. Um, However, I can't say I blame this on him totally. The problem is, is that the film was shot in Japan with Japanese actors spe speaking English, and it really didn't. It didn't. They didn't have very much emotion because it's obvious they're speaking phonetically. Yeah, I give it. I give it two two cons against it. It, sh it should. I don't know why they felt it was so important for them to speak English. I would have been happy if it was subtitled. So that seems like it was a suit decision. Uh, yeah, it obviously. must have been a suit decision. It was a stupid decision because it was distracting. It, I would have loved to have seen it in Japanese and read the subtitles. And two, Billy Drago's awful. Isn't awful. It? awful. Absolutely, Absolutely awful. awful. Outside of that, I, it, this is my favorite Masters of Horror episode. Um, I think it's the only one that fulfills the potential idea of taking like a great so-called great fil horror filmmaker and doing his best thing in an hour format. And I think Miike is the only one who kind of fulfilled his potential, so to speak, in ways that uh, the other directors just kind of just missed the mark or kind of did it half-assed. You know, I, I, I thought the production values were yeah. outstanding. It felt like a film. It felt like a it real film. It felt like a film. It, visually, the art direction is outstanding in this episode. I, I agree with you on that. And it's yet, like, it's, it's, it's hard like to watch. It's torturous. Point. And yes. if it wasn't for mm -hmm. the fact that they're fucking trying to speak English when they shouldn't be. It's really hard. There really is an interesting, powerful story there. There is. It could there have been. really is. There could have been decent, but that's a very big minus against it. I mean, that that really did ruin it. For I me. mean, it's really hard to explain to the. I, I would encourage everyone to go out and see this. I, I don't think this is one of those things where we shouldn't give away the story. No, I'm not going to tell anything about the story, but I will say but, this too. I think even you agree. I had to have the subtitles on for some of it because even though they were speaking English, I couldn't understand a lot of what they were saying. It was yeah, a very true. bad, very bad in turn doing that, and also. What I did not like, and I, I have to be honest, there's a scene where we mentioned earlier, a torture scene, and I feel it's very misogynistic and it goes on way too long. I feel, you know, it, it just was enough was enough. It goes on for maybe five minutes. See, I don't know if it's, I think that's a wrong word, misogynistic. I think sadistic. It is sadistic. It but is I a felt very... Well, you know what, though? Sadi I, I dis yeah, it, it is sadistic. But it fits the plot. But it fits the plot. It, it's a very important plot point, too, because I, without giving too much away, it explains why a certain person is the way they are. Yeah, but it lingers in, and in a lingers very effective lingers. way. I mean, it well, lingers I mean, on too much. I thought I think like Alfred Hitchcock, the most disturbing thing is in your mind. You know what you don't right. see. I like I like what's like eh, in Psycho. Sometimes. I think Psycho is a lot. I think you know. Miike is the only one. I agree with you. I don't like torture porn. I don't like torture. I That's think I Miike like. is the only director, take or leave his stuff, who can get away with it. Everyone else is trying to copy him. Eli Roth is trying to copy. Definitely. Mike, when he does like hostile. Oh, it's obvious. Know? I'll give you that. Mike, there is a, a purpose behind what he's doing. It never feels exploitive to me, mm -hmm. um, as, as unbearable as it is to watch. How about you guys? How would you rate it on your scale? Is it one of your favorite ones? I, I, I liked it. I, I thought the story was a little bit muddled. Yeah, I, I did too. I was just trying to figure out some things and like sometimes I was like wondering what, what the point is, but it wasn't a bad uh, at all, I, I like. I mean, I thought it was okay. I think it's the most beautiful. I think you agree with me on that one. The most beautiful shot. Production design. Yeah, production design if, is amazing. If you want to see a film, I think that succeeds a lot better in this type of filmmaking, without the violence, of course, is a, a wonderful '60s film entitled Kaidon, which is one of the most beautiful oh, films awesome. I've ever seen. Yeah. In fact, uh, many films have ripped off uh, Kaidon. In fact, Conan the Barbarian. Uh, there's a very famous scene where he's uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I believe, is being written in kanji. And, um, well, they're trying to uh, bring protect him, him back to spirit. life yeah. and bring him out. And protect him from spirits. Right. That is taken from Hochi the Earless, which is a um, one of the stories in Kaidon. One of the most wonderful horror films I've ever seen. It's a, a, a living canvas. Just, just, just to forewarn you horror fans, it's not a scary horror film. Just just be aware. It's just a very poetic, visually beautiful horror film. Oh, horror film. and I want to mention, too, another film that ripped off Kaidon, not to go off topic, was a movie entitled Tales from the Dark Side, the film. Uh, there's a story. Actually, I can't believe it. I believe, is it? No, it's not. Billy Drago. Actually, you know something? Conan the Barbarian didn't rip that off. That's actually in Robert E. Howard's novelization. Well, actually, Conan actually, uh, John Millis story. on the commentary mentions that Kaidon was his biggest influence. Oh, on but there. that's actually in the original story when he ran into uh, problems with Dulce Doom. Well, we only have three minutes left, so let's uh, run on to the last one. Sorry, the last one is entitled uh, Hackle's Tale, which was directed didn't by. Didn't see it. 
uh, John McNaughton, who you might recognize yeah, from um, yeah, from Henry Porch of a Serial Killer, a very good director. Um, this actually turned out to be, I believe, one of the again one of the strongest episodes of the series. Um, and it's funny that the directors who are not really established as masters of horror actually did the better work this time. <laughs> um, this one takes a, a Clive Barker story. Um, and actually, I guess you say it's Clyde Barker's adaptation, kind of a Frankenstein type story of reanimating the dead. And uh, it leads to a very shocking conclusion. It's very disturbing, in including necrophilia. And oh, yes. it's mm. pretty surprising. I mean, I'm surprised that this one didn't get banned from being on television. So am I. Um, it's very gory and disturbing, I, isn't it? Yeah, I've never really wondered what zombie sex was, but this film pretty much takes care of that. Is it like Reanimator? No. No. It's like, <laughs> all I'll say, it's just try to imagine a nymphomaniac with a whole bunch of dead people. And you actually see an orgy gangbang. It's pretty disturbing. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, you know what's so funny is that... Uh, well, what's the story? Well, it's a story it's about a man kind of like he, he wants to do experiments to bring back the dead. And you know, and he talks about Frankenstein, and you know, he because he, he Frankenstein they pretend is a real character in this and one. And it's a period piece. And it's a period piece, mm -hmm. and um, it doesn't like he does experiment, period? it doesn't work. Like so then they tell him, they tell him, they tell 18th century, yeah, 18th they, 18th century. they Frankenstein 18th century. era, and they because they say Frankenstein's doing these new experiments. You know, mm -hmm. have you read about them? So, but this one uh, he tries the experiment, it doesn't work. So someone rec recommends that he goes to a necromancer, which is you know, a person mm -hmm. who brings people back from the dead, and um, he discuss he runs into this man who uh, takes him into his house and he finds out a terrible secret about this woman who he makes a deal with the necromancer and I don't want to give anything away. Did you guys like it? I, I liked it. It's very disturbing, very eerie. And, uh, I gotta I rent can't, it. I can't I'm say rent I it. liked it. It was disturbing. But it's, just, it's, a fa it's fascinating. I can't say it's great. It's interesting. You won't, when you see it, you'll go, I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, exactly. So now as a wrap right. up, who do you think the new masters of horror are now that are not obviously making Showtime series, but who are out there that are influencing oh. horror right now? Well, right now, we're about, actually, we got to wrap this up. I would say my favorite director right now in terms of science fiction, I'll be real quick, is Vincenzo Natale, who did Cube. I think he's a great director. He His new movie sounds interesting. Yeah, he's a great director. Uh, it's called Splice. I, I forgot the it's name. It's his take on Frankenstein. But he's also doing um, uh, films. Maybe Neil Marshall, Doomsday coming out. Maybe what about him. you, Jeff? Not Eli Roth. Yeah, I was going to say. There's Not James Wan. There's nobody really. Oh, I can think God, of who James comes Wan, to mind. you piece of shit. Well, anyway, we got to wrap this up. So the guy who did 28 yelling. Weeks Later, I don't know his name. Until next week. But, uh, I thought he was talented. Oh, yeah. Rodrigo. He's got Moxie. Francisco Rodriguez. You could fade us out. But yeah, uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, actually, I think I think.